Okay, good afternoon everybody and welcome to what is now the last of our parallel sessions. It's a little bit sad, it seems to have whizzed by really quickly. I am absolutely delighted to be chairing this afternoon's session um, where Dr. Mary Delaney is going to talk to us about some of the research that she has done, um, carried out for her recently completed PhD on unpacking information literacy in the academy understanding the concept and impact of information literacy in higher education from multiple perspectives. So those of you who don't know Mary, Mary is um, currently the Head of Library and Information Services in IT Carlo. Mary took up that role in September 2014 and prior to that um, Mary was actually my predecessor in Maynooth University as Senior Librarian for Learning um, and Research Information Services. Um, and as Brian mentioned yesterday in his talk, if you don't, if you haven't heard of Mary and you don't know who she is, you should, you should do so. Well done for coming along and finding out. <laughs> good afternoon, everybody, and good afternoon to our colleagues joining us on the live stream as well. Um, what I'm going to do today is talk to you about the really powerful opportunity provided to us by information literacy and say that it has not yet reached its full potential and I'm going to say that very much based on doctoral research that as Lorna said I just finished where I looked at the concept ownership and impact of information literacy in higher education and I did doctoral work but I did it in education not in library and information science because I do absolutely agree with what Sarah Moore said earlier on that sometimes we are invisible and sometimes we um, are doing great things but we are not always the best at trumpeting the great things that we do. So what I wanted to do is take effectively library work out of library and information science and situate it in education and look at it in a different way, in a different lens. And what I'm going to talk about today is very much around the multiple perspectives of information literacy and not just talk about it from a library uh, perspective and, work and present to you some findings from from my research around our understanding of it. Do we have, within higher education, a common and shared understanding of it? What impact is it having? And how well is it integrated into the academy? The multiple perspectives that I'm going to present to you today are from um, the people that I carried out focus groups with for my doctoral research, which are students, library staff, academic staff, student services staff, and key informants. Key informants are people from around the world who we read about in terms of journal articles and books, so I selected a number of people who have really been influential in leading information literacy, um, and some of those were Skype interviews and some of them were face-to-face -face interviews, but it's very much about um, how, what do they understand it to be, and overall then presenting an understanding of it from all of these various perspectives. And what I'm going to do is give you some quotes and really rather than maybe um, celebrating in this presentation all the great work that we are all doing, I'm going to present areas in which I think we need to do some more work as I found from my doctoral uh, research. So one student I interviewed, um, and these have all been anonymized, a PhD student, and he was also a tutor, so he said he had never come across the, the term, if you like, information literacy. And the concept to him, when I discussed it with him, was something that was fairly new. Now, he had reached PhD level and obviously was you know, succeeding along the way without ever really having to meaningfully engage, if you like, with the actual topic in how, in how we might understand it. Equally, a second year student that I spoke to, she said that she equally was kind of unclear about the subject, but she kind of understood that there was things like plagiarism and referencing and all of these skills that she needed to know, but in terms of it being an information literacy or an academic literacy, again, was very vague about the concept. So students in my research, I would argue, they identify more with an absence of these skills rather than a choice about not using them. And what I mean by that is that once you said to them, you know, when you have to do a project and you have to find material and you have to put together a bibliography and all of those steps along the way in terms of getting evidence to write an argument for a piece of work that they needed to submit for assessment, they understood it in that language more than they understood it in the language in which 
in terms of information literacy or the way we might at times talk about it. Um, and they understood that they needed these skills, that they didn't necessarily have them, that they really struggled with them. They talked about how at times it felt like maybe another subject that they had to take on in terms of finding information, using e-books, OPACs, journals, uh, using VLEs, putting together um, a bibliography, using a certain citation style. They understood all of the responsibility they had in that space, but they would have identified that they didn't always have these skills and they didn't know where to go to get them. And they identified them as something they needed but didn't always have. Have. And they acknowledge that they can use Facebook and Google and all of these smartphones and all of that, but that d does not translate into academic literacy such as information literacy. Um, and Brian yesterday spoke really well, and I think everybody really enjoyed Brian's talk about the whole notion of a digital university and the whole notion of digital literacy. But there is a lot of research in this area, and it is complex and possibly more complex than we give it credit for, but there is this new emerging literacy called vernacular literacy, which kind of acknowledges how students use social media in terms of how they talk to one another and how they engage with it, but it does not translate to academic business as such. So I suppose the key message is the fact that students can use things it would be wrong of us to assume that because they can use social media and they can use a lot of digital devices that that makes them in any way digitally literate. Um, and we all know student statuses are changing, they're producers, they're not just consumers and we, we spoke a lot at this conference about 3D printing and all the different ways they're starting uh, to produce and yet they would absolutely acknowledge that they, have, they are challenged in terms of pr the production of knowledge and uh, knowledge with integrity and new output that they want to generate in terms of their academic output and we have a responsibility as librarians uh, to somehow help them in this space and we are doing a lot of work in this area. Student services then, they are the people maybe who are like um, our access officers and you know the people who help around our institutions. Um, I spoke to them and they some of what they said would indicate to me that they are also connecting um, kind of the digital literacy bit with the use of the device rather than the actual literacy bit in terms of engaging with the learning. So one quote I had was um, from somebody who said, you, if you can work your Facebook account, you can work any technology that the university has to offer. And it's pointing and clicking and there's nothing more complicated to it than that. Um, but equally, that would indicate that we're still connecting these literacy things with IT ability, which again, like the research indicates, that that is not the case. And there was this quote that came up from an academic, but student services would have, would have kind of referenced this idea as well. Why stop being clever when you go to do your academic work? This sense that students are really clever, they can, they're very tech savvy, they can use lots of different mediums and environments, but when they come into our academic environments, they struggle. And there's a sense that why don't they bring those skills that they have into our libraries? And, and if they did that, it would all be okay. When actually the evidence and the literature would indicate that it's not as simple as that. In terms of academic staff or academic colleagues, they are very frustrated and confused in this space, not just in terms of information literacy, but in terms of cyberspace and how information has changed so much. They don't understand the concept the way we understand information literacy. Um, they, they are very concerned about what's going on within our institutions in terms of the amount of information that's out there, in terms of who's policing it, who's managing it, and in terms of who's helping students through it. Um, and they speak about the onus has come on us and different people in, in the universities to make stabs at it. But they said one quote was, it's another nail in the coffin. It's so frustrating. And somebody yesterday referenced, you know, we have academic staff who are working maybe between three or four different um, jobs. They can be part-time. They might even have an office in, and they're moving very quickly to lots of different places. And it is very difficult um, for them. But equally then, it's very difficult for us to get them to engage maybe in a way that we might like them to engage with us. Um, and it's the structures, if you like, are, are posing challenges in this regard as well. Um, and one of the academics said, you know all that clever stuff you do outside of college, like why don't you bring that into college? Um, and again, back to the whole notion of why stop being clever when you go to do your academic work. One of the lecturers said, and kind of it showed an understanding of it in terms of it's, it needs to, this whole area needs to be understood generously and, and in a rich range of expression and there's certainly it's a pillar of the student experience. So it's not, and we all know that from our work, it's not that people don't appreciate the work and what's needed and why it's so important, but it's the, the system, if you like, is challenging us in terms of meaningfully engaging. 
in a way we'd like to. And we can't underestimate the challenges that really have been posed by the evolving mediums. And one of the lecturers would have said, you can have a, vir a virtual person with virtual results, large class sizes. You don't always know your students. Um, you know, they're uploading material to turn it in. Then they're uploading it into a VLE. You're downloading it and correcting it. You don't have a lot of face-to-face -face time. So it is difficult to know if the student has maybe you know, come up with things that aren't their ideas or how, how authentic uh, their work is. And one of the lecturers made a good point, she said coming in and downloading something and copying and plagiarising, it's not like stealing a book. It doesn't feel like you've taken something from a, a book off a shelf in the library and walked out with it. It, it just feels different. So there, and one of the phrases that I just think is really interesting is this whole notion of academic schizophrenia, where you can present yourself in different ways depending on how you've engaged with the information and turn it out in different ways at different times. And that the overall, the structures are really challenged by this in terms of managing this because of our large class sizes and because of um, so many different reasons. So the democratizing of information in terms of the, the massification of information, if you like, it has demeaned or recontextualized expertise and scholarship. Students are presented with a world of information that's very easily accessible in one way, but it has challenged privileged knowledge held in esteem by the academy. And our academic colleagues are really struggling with this. They would have spoken about how they knew years ago the canon of literature in their field. They knew the key authors. They were able to tell their students about them. But this has all changed, and this is posing real challenges challenges. From our perspective then as librarians, um, and some of what Sarah said this morning really struck a chord with me. I think we have real potential here to, to really engage, and this is something that we're really good at. But we still, at some level, seem to feel quite ancillary to the, pro to the whole process and at times invisible. And we have a sense that at times, and these are some quotes from some librarians that I interviewed, that we feel we're kind of in a babysitting capacity, that we maybe don't feel we have as much space or as much scope as we'd like to do things. And again, that's back to the whole structure that we're operating in. Um, and this person said, oh, sometimes they feel that the academics just say, oh, send them down to the library and it's kind of a babysitting thing and that the academics don't really understand the full scale of what we can do. Um, and equally, I think there's a sense that we're still struggling with the whole notion of skills, that if there's an information skill and we'll show them how to put together a bibliography and they'll know how to do this skill, but that it actually is more than that. Um, and as, as it goes Go, as time goes by and with our digital literacy at digital uh, universities, all the initiatives from the National Forum and teaching and learning, th this has all been explored that bit more. So while information is evolving, information literacy is evolving within the ca academy, I would say that it does remain a challenge. And the library, while we've led the agenda in higher education, it seems we do still, despite all our work, view our role at times as ancillary to the core discipline knowledge and the core business of what goes on within our institutes. So the key informants then, who are the people, the last set of people who I'm going to present you with some quotes from, they're people who would have written a lot in the literature. They would be very much the people who would kind of have written journal articles, book chapters, really evolved the whole concept. So while all the other people that I spoke to presented it in very much a context, a more applied context, the key informants very much are looking at it from um, a more kind of theoretical perspective. And they would have said things like, there's no point in teaching it unless you link it to the curriculum. A lot of us would know that and say that too. But they totally change, if you like, the wording that they use around it and how they, um, how they even view it. And another person would have said, I see it as uh, at this moment, it's around valuing and unpacking people's information experiences in all kinds of concepts. It's, it's not just about what we teach them in our uh, third level, it's all about life and what happens outside of life and has a real important lifelong learning, critical thinking skill and something that's much bigger um, and, and very important um, and not just confined to what they might need in terms of um, getting their coursework done. And this is where the really interesting questions can get asked and some of what Brian spoke about yesterday. Why is a critical skill such as information and literacy not given greater allowance in an academic world? And we need to consider at this point then things like the works by Tara Bravis on the University of Google where she talks about considering macro level socioeconomic forces, funding cutbacks, uh, changes in curriculum delivery, 
tight modularized structures, two 12 week periods, people under enormous pressure to deliver um, core material within very short periods of time, not having time to bring the library in. Um, the library being brought in, if it would go in often in a very um, ancillary type way. So th these, this is the st where we read about these things in the literature, but it, these are the issues we really need to consider. And almost unless we can kind of somehow find solutions to this, we'll still be dealing with all the other areas that we um, are dealing with all the time. And one of the key informants said it's very dif difficult if we're very much focused on information literacy and in the traditional sense to get a real sense of the impact of it. And it is really, really important and it's only becoming more important. We saw in Ireland the, um, with our presidential elections that time where there was a tweet, for example, read out in prime time. We lo a lot of people here will remember that. And how then there was discussion around the, the tweet. Was it real? Was it not real? There was a 24-hour window where the, all of this discussion happened and then the election was at a really coming to an end. And some people argue that it changed the course the, of the results because this tweet was read out and derailed the campaign. We saw at the weekend here in Ireland, um, the media commenting on or not commenting on what was said in the doll and all of that information and privilege around quoting information, using it, not using it. So these are almost, not just almost, they really are issues for democracy, they're citizenship type issues. And we are in a really strong position to help our graduates to, to critically deal with these issues. Um, and the key informants, this is, I suppose, the space that they're operating in. And they're very much looking at saying it in ways to consider it in the bigger picture. And instead, one of them, and I know some people will practice this, but one of the key informants was saying that, that librarians were just thinking about it in a different way, and we need to think about it in terms of saying, we're not looking for information, we're looking for evidence. And how can we get you the best evidence to make your best argument? And if you make the best argument, then you'll get the best results, as opposed to maybe talking about finding books and journals to, to write assignments. So it's about thinking possibly about it differently, and that's what our key informants do. So where to from here? So when I was um, in the lift earlier on today, there was a number of us in the lift when we were checking out, and there was a person in the lift who wasn't at the conference, he was a guest in the hotel, and he was just saying, I've never seen so many librarians in a, a room before. And he was saying, what do you call a, a, a number of librarians? Like, what, what's the collective for a librarian? And there was a number of us in the lift, and we were coming up with different suggestions. And one was maybe a silence of librarians. And he said, I think a gaggle of librarians, based on the activity in the hotel and, and the dinner last night. Um, and perhaps we are very invisible, and perhaps we don't see our own ability to make a difference as much as we ought to. Um, and really, while there's so many angles I could take from my uh, research and different things that I've taken from my findings, one of the things that I do think is that we probably need to consider it less a question of ownership and impact and more of engagement. And that's something that we need to consider across all of our institutes. And when Sarah was posing those questions this morning, the first three questions that she posed, I did think, isn't it interesting that we're still answering these questions 10 or 15 or 20 years on? Like information literacy was coined as a phrase in 1974. So that's 41 years ago. And we're still talking about the role of libraries and library staff in teaching and learning and what can we do and what could we do. When so many initiatives are already going on, if you look at LARC and LETS and LIST and so many things that are going on around the country and they've been going on for so long and are so established and we're still answering these questions despite all the work that we're all doing in teaching and learning environments already. There's very mixed understandings of the concept of information literacy within the academy. It's not understood in any kind of collective way in, in, in its sense as a term, information literacy, information skills, the academic literacy, digital literacy. We're all talking about different terms and the concept isn't understood in any one uniform way. It's bits and pieces across all of our academies. And really, I would argue, until it's more fully theoretically and conceptually understood within our academies, we'll be challenged in terms of reaching an end goal that we all agree with. Other aspects of my work that I, I didn't get into today, but there is this a lot of work, and, and I used a conceptual framework that very much looked at what's privileged knowledge and what's unprivileged knowledge, and the disciplinary knowledge that's taught across our, all, all our institutions. 
That is the privileged knowledge. The unprivileged knowledge then is the ancillary that goes along that. And there are ac academies are forced, obviously, because we need to have graduates and we need to have um, people who come out qualified or skilled or with, with degrees and masters and PhDs, but it's the, it's the discipline that continues to be privileged. And, f and that's the way for all kinds of good reasons. But things like information literacy then is, is unprivileged in terms of trying to get that into the curriculum and get that in with the discipline is, is really difficult and that is a challenge and something we still are working on. Uh, but we need to be mindful of that and that is a very big issue and something that um, is possibly bigger even theoretically um, than we might have given it credit for. We do need to guard against assumptions just because, and I know we, we are aware of that, but just because somebody can use Facebook or Twitter or social media or an iPad or an iPhone does not mean that they are in any way digitally literate and we've had this discussion 20 years ago when there was the notion of IT literacy and people using computers and then it evolved to information literacy but it did surprise me that we're coming back to that space again as the technology is evolving we're somehow still falling into those assumptions that we would have made a long time ago and the medium has changed everything and while we're comfortable with e-books and e-journals we can't make any assumptions around our academic colleagues being comfortable in that space because the, my research would indicate that they're not, um, and that they're not for reasons that, that are very complex and broad. Um, and situated information literacy matters in that different people will use information in different ways at different times, and that's okay. So there are different levels maybe that we need to get to, and, and sometimes people will be able to find information very easily, sometimes they'll need more help. There's just different layers to it, um, and situated information literacy acknowledges that. But I would argue that it is critical to see librarians doing more research in this area. It's critical to see librarians doing um, more doctoral work to really understand and engage with these concepts and in doing so by engaging equally with our academic colleagues in the same space and we need to continue to have dialogues outside of our libraries talking to we're all converted we know the power of information literacy we know the value of these things um, but it's not us that we need to convince we still have to convince people outside of uh, our areas on this i'm going to finish with thanks first of all to thank all my um former colleagues in Maynooth University for all their uh, help and support and good wishes when I moved and to thank my new colleagues in the Institute of Technology in Carlo as well for the warm welcome that I've got since I joined there and finally to thank you all very much for your attention this afternoon um, and this is my email address if anyone wants to follow up on anything with me after today. Thank you all.